Would you turn please to the book of Isaiah and we'll read in Isaiah chapter 35. Isaiah chapter 35. Verse 10. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. And one more reading in the same book, chapter 51. Whenever God speaks, it's important. When he repeats himself, it must be very important. Isaiah 51 and verse 11, Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. And here are these words again. Everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. We're going in thought this morning to Africa, to these two women. And uh, as your handout points out, Christians were very quick to note that if you put the two names together, you end up with this idea of everlasting joy, perpetual felicity, in other words. Um, not going to be able to do uh, justice to the topic, so I'm just going to hurry through some uh, comments. Uh, Vivia Perpetua lived with uh, her husband and her infant son, and along with um, Felicitas in Carthage, which is now modern Tunis in North Africa. There was a large Christian community at the time, but the Roman Emperor Septimius Severus believed that Christians who refused to sacrifice to Roman gods were traitors, and he determined then to persecute them. Uh, so the Christians who were rounded up in uh, just one arrest were Saturninus, Secundus, Revocatus, Felicitas, and Perpetua. The man who taught them the word of God, a man named Satyrus, wasn't there at the time, and he turned himself in to be with them of his own accord because, of course, he was a believer and wanted to share with them. Um, one of the things was that uh, Perpetua had a little child, and Felicitas was expecting, so this added, of course, to their difficulty. But um, she said it was great kindness that Perpetua was allowed to actually have her child come into the prison. They were moved from a very um, unhealthy and dangerous section to a new area, which was much easier. And then she made this amazing statement. She said, my prison became a palace to me, and I would rather have been there than anywhere else. She had her child. She was with the other believers. But her father came, and uh, you can only imagine the pressure he applied uh, that if she remained faithful, uh, as a Christian that was bringing great shame on the family. Think about me, think about your dad, think about your family, think about your child. Uh, and on more than one occasion, he used that kind of logic. It must have been incredibly, incredibly difficult for her to remain faithful. She did point to, um, um, one, one way she answered, she pointed to a, a cup or a pot, and she said, if you call this any other name, does it change what it is? He said, no. And she said, well, I'm a Christian. How can I say I'm anything other than a Christian. Um, their attitude was such that the man who was their jailer actually became a Christian. He was saved just watching how these Christians responded. Now, we have um, probably the oldest record of a non-inspired Christian writing is Perpetua's um, diary that she kept of this experience. Of course, it goes up to just before they were to die, but I'll... Um, it, it, other Christians finished it, so I'm, I'm going to do that right now, just read you what the other people wrote. When the day of the games drew near, it was March 7th, 2002. They went forth from prison into the amphitheater, as it were, into heaven, cheerful and bright of countenance. If they trembled at all, it was for joy, not for fear. Perpetua followed behind, Felicity, likewise, rejoicing that she had borne a child in safety, that she might fight with the beasts. And I didn't tell you this, but she was very concerned. An expectant woman could not be tortured in Rome. She was afraid 
that if her baby came when it was due, which was nine months, that the others would be sent out to be executed and she wouldn't be able to be with them, that she would be killed later on by herself. And so all of the Christians in the prison prayed and um, about this, and her baby was born on the eighth instead of the ninth month. And so now Felicity was able to join with all of her Christian friends as they walked out into the arena. When they've been brought to the gate and were being compelled to put on the dress of the priests of Saturn, that is the men, and the women the dress of the priestesses of Cirrus, the noble Perpetua remained firm to the end. She would not. She said, for this cause came we willingly to this point, and they didn't want to lose their liberty now. They came out. Uh, they left the prison for the arena joyfully as the crowd roared to see blood shed. Satyrus, Saturninus, and Revocatus were ordered to run the gauntlet between the the, the hunters, the two rows of hunters, and as these men were made to run through them, they were beaten on the way. Secundulus had died in prison, and afterwards these two men, Revocatus and Satyrus, were destroyed by wild beasts, and then Saturninus was beheaded. Now, I'm running over this, and it is very hard to picture the terrifying scene just from the words I'm using. Just think, to, uh, think of being surrounded by people screaming for your blood to be facing wild animals and armed executioners, to be a tiny island of Christianity in a scene of paganism and roiling, seething hatred. The description says a mad heifer charged the women and tossed them. Perpetua was thrown and fell, and when she sat upright, her robe being rent at the side, she drew it over to cover herself, mindful of modesty. Then she saw Felicity smitten down. She went to her and helped her up, and they stood hugging each other, awaiting the end. Perpetua then called to the other martyrs who were fighting the animals and were not yet dead. She said, stand fast in the faith. Do not be weakened by what we are going through. Then they let loose a leopard, and it wasn't long before it attacked and mauled the Christians. The crowd was still impatient, and they began screaming for the deaths of the Christians. Perpetua and her friends were lined up to be executed by the gladiators. The soldier who approached her was trembling so badly he could scarcely hold his sword. And those who watched said that she reached out, she took his shaking hands in hers, slowly guided the sword for him to her neck, mentioned the name of the Lord Jesus quietly in prayer, and left the world entering into his presence. Now you say, that happened so long ago, we're talking about two African women what is its bearing on me today, let alone on the world? Well, the impact that these faithful Christians had on their society is incalculable. They literally changed the face of the world and the course of history, turning the Roman Empire to Christianity from paganism and Caesar worship. Because all they had to do was just take a pinch of incense and just put it on an altar and they could live. But that was Caesar worship, and they refused to worship anyone but God. A poignant book describing the martyrdom of these believers held a unique place in Christian congregations for many years. It was so popular during the fourth century that Augustine had to protest and tell the Christians that it wasn't as important as the Bible because they were reading about these two women and their faithfulness and were deeply stirred. Now, as I noted in your handout, there have actually been more people martyred for Christ in the last 50 years of the 20th century than in the first 300 years of church history. While we know so few of their names, the Lord Jesus knows each one who suffered for him. You remember the famous quote from Tertullian that the, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And the more that the enemy tried to silence by death the Stephen-like testimony of believers, the more people were reached with the truth of the gospel like Saul of Tarsus. And I think it's going to be a glorious day when just ordinary people like us watch people like Perpetua and Felicity crown with the martyr's crown for their loyalty and for their faith. So I want to just do exactly what the early Christians did. I want to take their two names and want to speak, as we read twice from the book of Isaiah, about everlasting happiness. Why is happiness so unachievable in this world? And I'm talking about lasting happiness. Why is it so short-lived? Here we're talking about everlasting happiness, and we have difficulty even understanding or grasping lifelong happiness. So why is it, these will be the two things we'll consider, why is happiness so elusive 
and temporary down here? And why is happiness so permanent and eternal up there? The reason is that sin has robbed us of a relationship with God. You were made for God. You were made for God. When he made human beings, he made a creature that was to be special to him. We are made of spirit and soul and body. And as spirits living in bodies, there's a part of us that is metaphorically starving. It's cut off from the source of life. If you were walking, I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but if you were walking through a a field and you saw a flower and you thought, isn't that beautiful? And you, you, you snapped it and brought it to yourself and smelled it and, and for some reason took it home. And people used to do this and put a, a, a flower between the pages of a book and close the book, put it on your shelf and then open the book a year later, that fragrant, vibrant flower would have lost its color, would have lost its aroma. It would be dead. When did it die? It didn't die when you put it in the book. It didn't die after a year in the book, sitting on your shelf. It died the moment that you snapped it from its source of life. That's when it died. The results, the effects of that death weren't seen immediately, but that's when it died. And when Adam and Eve turned from God, that's when we died. That's when the human race was cut off from our source of life. So here we are limping through life, trying to make do. The devil has built around us a society that is like a huge amusement park. You understand, of course, that when you put the, word, the letter A in front of a word, you negate its meaning. So to muse is to think deeply. To amuse is to not think deeply. And like an amusement park occupying us, keeping us busy, filling our time, we are amused and we rarely stop to muse, to think about why we're here, what is life about, where are we going, how can we know God? Sin has robbed us of a relationship with God. Sin has robbed us of significance in life. So if the first point takes us back in thought to our, our roots, where the human family began, then this point right here has to do with our present. Human beings long for significance. Every one of us, deep in our heart, long for some kind of significance to mean something to somebody. I remember... Maybe you've heard about why do bad things happen to good people. It's not worth your reading, by the way. But in, in that book, the rabbi tells about a, a man who came to him and said, Rabbi, uh, a man in the office died. He'd been working there for years. A man in the office died. Within just a few days, somebody else was, was sitting at his desk. Somebody else had taken his place. Somebody else was doing his job. It was as if he had never been. Rabbi, he said, Shouldn't, shouldn't a human being be more important than that? We all long for significance. Mindless evolution posits that we are mere accidents. And, and if, if, if all we are are just accidents, if all we are is just a particular collection of atoms, then there's nothing significant about anything you do, anything you think, anything you ever become, because all you are is just an accident. Language, thought, ideas, achievements, philosophies, beliefs, all of them are not merely short lives, but are completely meaningless. We've been robbed of any significance in life by our sin. Significance requires permanence, something lasting. We all understand we're not lasting. We're all passing. But we, but we, we would love to do something that lasts. We don't want to just spend our life building sandcastles on the beach to watch it all washed away. But the ability to do something that lasts is one of the very things that sin has robbed from us. We're cut off from the God of eternity. We're cut off from his eternal kingdom. You see, once a person is saved, no matter how young or recently saved, that person has been joined to the eternal God. He's part of an eternal kingdom. Whatever he does in his life in obedience to God is going to last forever. But sin robs us of that. And if that is not bad enough, Sin has robbed us of any hope when it comes to death. This is now a look into the future. If you want to see that played out in a very pathetic and poignant way, 
There is a book in our Bible that illustrates this. It is the book of Ecclesiastes. And the man who wrote the book was a wealthy, wise, powerful man, Solomon. But to that man, who didn't seem to be able at that point in his life to look beyond the horizon of earth, to, to see beyond the grave, to that man, life was a huge enigma. It was a mystery. And when you're reading his book, you'll hear him asking this question, who knows, who knows, who knows? He can't come to a final answer about life because he's not factoring God into it. It's all a mystery to him, and therefore it's all valueless. And you'll find him asking, what profit? What profit? What profit is there to this? What, what value is there to what I'm doing? He was facing the fact that it, he was hitting a dead end, if you will. He was watching a freight train called death roaring down at him, and he understood that his wealth could not buy him another day. His wisdom could not devise a way to escape. His position as the king meant absolutely nothing. He had no authority over death, which is why he said, there is no one, there is no one who has power over death. There is no one can retain the spirit in the day of death. Neither has he power in that day. Do you know what he had to do? Every night, armed soldiers circled his bed area because of fear in the night. He was haunted. He was haunted by the fact that no matter how high he had climbed, he could lose his life in a moment's time. It is sin that has robbed us of any hope. person who is not saved. Uh, let me just, if, if you'll allow me, let me just apply it to myself. I couldn't look ahead before I was saved. I, I, I couldn't think about what the preacher was talking about. I couldn't think about the coming of the Lord or about dying or about eternity. The only peace I had was in ignoring, not thinking about, but ignoring facts. Because if I looked ahead, there was no hope for me. Now, I am not looking forward to dying. I, 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 I love life. <laughs> I love what I'm doing. I'd, I'd rather pay you to let me preach than be be paid not to. I, I, I'm not looking forward to die. But I have hope in my death. I know where I'm going. I know what's going to happen the moment after I flatline. I know that I'm going to be absent from this body, physical body, and I'm going to be at home, not just present, but I'm going to be at home with the Lord. So why is happiness so eternal and unbroken up there? We live in a world of tears and sorrow and disappointment and grief. Why is up there so different? Why are things down here the way they are? Because of sin. Why is up there so different? Because sin can't enter. Sin can't get in. And the only people that are going to be in are people whose sins have been washed away. So allow me then just to take the three points I went over with you very quickly and notice, first of all, believers have an unbroken and eternal relationship with God. This is a relationship that goes, if, if you want to grasp its parallel, it goes back to the Garden of Eden for its parallel. Adam and Eve walked with God. That's what God wished. And I, I don't know what those days must have been like. I mean, people have the idea of it, uh, primitive human beings uh, being Neanderthal-like, knuckles dragging on the ground. And Adam must have been the most intelligent man who ever lived, mortal man who ever lived. And the, the visits with God must have been mind-expanding to be walking with your Creator and learning from your Creator because God created us with the mental and spiritual capacity to interact with God, to enjoy what God enjoys, His Son. Now, what happens is when a person is saved, the thing that sin shattered is restored, and a human being comes into the enjoyment of a relationship with God. Somebody has said that you can join the literary society and you be, can become informed. You can join the temperance society and you can be 
reformed. You can join just society at large and become deformed, but it is only when you join the Lord Jesus that you become transformed. So a sinner who was living in his sins, who had no links with God, no relationship with God, comes alive the moment she or he trusts Christ is brought into a living and eternal link with God and the fellowship and enjoyment that God intended for a human being is restored by the Lord Jesus. That's part, that's part of what Peter meant when he wrote, Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Not just bring me to heaven, but bring me right now to God. I think I mentioned this here once before, maybe online, but I was... I was preaching the gospel to an audience of uh, Latinos and Latinas, and um, the pulpit was here. Over here was another little stand set up, and a bilingual brother here was translating for me. So I would say, I was trying to be very conscious of him, I would say maybe a sentence or two, and he would say a couple of paragraphs of what I had just said. So, of course, I didn't understand it, so I didn't know everything he was saying. But while I was preaching, I quoted that verse. And I said, now here is God, here are we. And the Lord Jesus suffered for sins to bring us to God. And over here, he's talking in Spanish and he did this. And I, I interrupted, I said, no, 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 no. Not this, this. The Lord Jesus didn't die to bring God and us together in the middle as if God gives up a little and we give up a little and, and the mediator finds common ground for us to meet. All the wrong was on our part. All the right was on his part. Christ died to bring us to God, to reconcile us to that God. This is a relationship that goes back to Eden for its parallel. This is a relationship that goes to Calvary for its basis. A human being who was saved is resting on, he's depending on, not something she or he did, but on what Christ did at Calvary. The cost of this, the cost of this was impossible for us to pay, but it was paid by the Lord Jesus on the cross. He gave his life. He gave his blood. To use his own words, he found a pearl of great price and he sold everything he had. He gave everything on the cross so that sinners could be saved. And the communion that seemed broken by our sin, listen to this, these mysterious words. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Not my father, my father. Nothing touched the father-son relationship, but my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Those are words that are to indicate to us the terrible cost it was to the Lord Jesus to go to that cross that we might be saved. Have you trusted him? Has your life been changed? Have you been linked now with the living God? Do you have the forgiveness of your sins? Or are you still wandering on the broad road? Because you see the curse that appeared so permanent fell on him and has resulted in eternal blessing for every person who trusts him. I told you that sin robs us of significance. Believers engage in eternally significant service to the King of Kings. That's an amazing thing. There was nothing of royalty about my family. There's nothing important about us. We were just ordinary commoners. And yet I, I, I'm linked with the greatest person who ever lived. Pardon me, the greatest person who's alive today. Everything that a Christian does, everything that a Christian does, with a view to his glory. It could be sweeping floors. It could be making lunch for the kids. It could be sitting at a computer terminal. It could be preaching the gospel. It could be driving children to Sunday school. Everything, everything that a human being who is saved does for the honor of the Lord Jesus is going to last forever. Remarkable statement Paul writes when he said about the judgment seat of Christ that every Christian is going to have praise from God. God is going to find something in all of our lives. No matter how much we feel we've failed, he's going to find something in all our lives that's going to last forever. When it comes to dying, sin has robbed us of any hope. But believers 
experience the full realization of their hope that to die, let me put it this way, everything that a sinner enjoys, everything that, that makes up his life ends the moment that person dies. Ends. Did he enjoy sports? Was he into alcohol, drugs? Did he love relationships? What, whatever. However you, wish, however you wish to describe the life of that human being, it all ends the moment he dies. He goes out alone into eternity to be alone forever, cut off from God everlastingly. It's a, it's a nightmare. It's a tragedy. Everything that a saved person enjoys from the hand of God only gets brighter and bigger and better when he steps into heaven. So that instead of death being a forlorn thing, why did, why, why did these women in their prison cell awaiting not just death, but a violent, horrible death? Why did she say, my, my, my prison cell was like a palace? Why did the other one, why did she bring to God that she might be able to, to go with her friends when they had to face death? Why are they standing there amidst all the bloodshed and, and one of their friends beheaded, others being torn apart by wild animals, and Perpetua is calling out, be faithful to death? It's because they knew that one moment beyond that death, they would be with Christ. My time is gone, but if, if, you, if you want to do this, let me, let me just go over the list very quickly. Salvation, joy, light, life, love, righteousness, habitations, and kingdom. All those words are linked with everlasting. They're things that we're going to enjoy everlastingly. And I hope today that if you do not yet know the Lord Jesus, that this will be the day. It's now afternoon. I hope that this will be the afternoon when you come into your first taste of everlasting joy by trusting Christ. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we bow and give thanks for the opportunity we have had to read thy word. We think of all of the work with the children going on just now, and we ask for thy rich blessing in salvation. Preserve us through the afternoon. Bless the, the supper and the meeting tonight. We humbly pray we are looking for souls to be saved, and we pray that God will intervene in the meetings for thine own glory and an answer to the cries of thy beloved people as we give thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.